I'm going, I'm going. <laughs> the Real Action Fishing Podcast is brought to you by Pertec. For all your hydraulic and industrial hose requirements, Pertec proudly Australian. Got him on, boys. BCF, gear up for the outdoors this weekend at your local BCF. Oh, he's well hooked. Let's get him in there, mate. Berkeley, catch more fish. Penn, let the battle begin. Oh, oh yes. Oh, yes, he. Quintrex, boating made easy. Mercury Outboards, reliable and powerful. And Marine Rescue, New South Wales volunteers saving lives on the water. G'day, welcome to the Real Action Fishing Podcast. Michael Guest, the high-speed racing ferret is here, Jonathan Bleakley. And I tell you, it's a bit of a cool... Well, it is... I shouldn't say that's a bit of a pun, really. I'm going to say a bit of a cool subject that we're <laughs> going to talk about today on the podcast. And we're going to get to it shortly, but that is... Thermal pollution, mm. yeah, which is something that um, I think a lot, you know, real avid fishers may know a bit about. It's something that I learned uh, a bit about a long time ago from somebody who we're going to give a, a call to. Um, actually, we might try and ring him. Actually, um, yeah, I call Matt advice. Hansen, who's um, who's actually involved with Ozfish out in in the Dubbo area, but real keen cod yellow belly mm. fisherman. I remember filming with him years and years ago. He might not even remember me. Actually, we'll give him a call. And <laughs> we'll stir him up a bit in a minute. But but um, the big thing when we talk, you know, and I know we've got to have water supply dams for agriculture and obviously human consumption and industry and so on and so on. But the the worst thing about that is that we're we've got to dam our our some of our big major rivers, you know, and um, for example, Burrendong Dam is one that comes to mind straight away, which is uh, out near or well, sort of Dubbo, Wellington Way. Um, but the trouble is, when you then dam that river system and then you want to release water out of there, you've really got to try and release it from the top. But dams are not set up to do that because the um, you've got the spillway at the top. The dams are not always at at a full maximum capacity level to let water out of the top, and quite often they're lower, so it's much easier to let the water out of the bottom. But we'll we'll talk to Matt a bit further mm. about this. So what happens then is that you have this, and, and it's if you've ever been for a swim in a farm dam in dirty water or 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 uh, in any sort of those sort of freshwater environments, it's a little bit different to seawater where it gets rolled around a bit more. But certainly, the deeper you go, the colder it gets, and you get in those dams the depth at the bottom of those dams um, and, and some are really deep and I'd be interested to see what the depths are but you, you can be looking at letting water out into um, a, a river system like the Macquarie um, where the water temperature is 10, 15, maybe even ending up to 20 degrees cooler. So if you've had a Murray cod that's laid eggs and done all the right things and trying to breed and then suddenly you get this massive mm. snap of cold weather oh sorry cold water i should say then that's a really bad thing so and for it, those following along at home Dusty, we'll get to fishing at the end of the podcast yeah, yeah. oh absolutely we're going to talk about the fish that you can catch in these environments yeah, but, but you've got to go back a step yeah. and and if we want healthy river systems and we want we want we want to be able to catch you know fantastic iconic fish like murray cod or golden perch yellow belly silver perch macquarie perch Tandanus catfish, all these other fish that live in the uh, in that sort of Murray Darling Basin area. And I'm only talking there. And we're talking the thermal pollution, but thermal pollution happens right at our doorstep, where we've got elevated temperatures this time of year from power station water, where the power stations, you know, they, they draw the water in, um, they use the water in the turbines to create steam, which 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 creates electricity, so on and so on, and then that hot water is pumped back into my local, our local waterway here, Lake mm. Macquarie. So you've got, on the other end of the scale, you've got warm water getting pushed into a system which should really be uh, where that warm water comes in. That water should be sitting around 15 to 17 degrees this time of year, um, starting to warm up just about to touch spring, but um, but it, it's not, you know. It, it can be 25 degrees mm. where it's coming in. So that's the other end of the scale too. So thermal pollution is a problem all over the world. But certainly, those big cold snaps are not good for our native fish. It's one of uh, how this has come about. It's a really topical, um, uh, topical conversation at the moment within that that fisheries management um, sector, if you will. And it's something that I've noticed um, a lot of the the community at the moment is start to show more interest in those conversations, Guesty, because we've realised that if we don't start to 
kind of speak about these things and take action against these things, it's killing the sport that we like to do. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's yeah. why, you know, so we're talking about fishing or well, we are talking mm. 100% about fishing and it's about how do we, yep. thermal pollution is such a, 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 a huge, a, a big dynamic that has such a huge broad ranging and effect other, on our other ones fish. that fall into that category as I dial in um, uh, Matt's number is things like fish screens and irrigation, um, screening irrigation pumps. Oh, absolutely. Millions of fish get sucked up to there. So if you're, if you're driving to work, we, you, might, you might be on the job site today and you're thinking, oh, you know, they're not telling me how to catch a fish. I promise yeah. you we'll get there. Um, but this is a really interesting one that, that I encourage so you to listen in. I've only texted Matt. him. But let's, let's see if he picks up. I'm sure he's at work or something. Oh, mate, he's a talker, Matt. I haven't spoken to him for years, but I know he's a talker. Doesn't want to Good talk on to you. Us. You're supposed to be organised here, no, Ferret. See what happens. If this rings out, you're in huge trouble, you realise. <laughs> Hello, it's Matt. Hey, oh, I thought I was going to ring out on you there. <laughs> there you go, mate. Good, good, good. So you've joined us a bit, a little bit, a different scenario than what we would usually do. We've we've called you kind of unannounced. I, I flicked Matt a text only a few minutes ago to see if he was available, and he did say any other day of the week he wouldn't be available. But today he's happy to to chat yeah, to me and you around the round day. table. G'day, mate. How are you going? It's Guesty here. How are you? G'day, Guesty. How are you, mate? mate oh, I'm well. I was just saying to, to the ferret here, I said, I don't know if Matt will remember me. It's been a long time since I've seen you. So, um, um, yeah, hope you're well and hope everybody's well. I certainly do spend my fair share, um, uh, sh- fair share of time, I should say, out in that part of the world through Dubbo and Yeovil and Menduran and all out in that country. I love uh, running around out there doing a bit of hunting as well mm. as fishing. Um, but uh, I haven't run into you for a little while. We've got a few mutual friends in that part of the world too. And and um, when Jono spoke about thermal pollution, I thought your name came up straight away. I thought, oh, mate, you're the man to talk about. And I guess Burundong Dam, which is your big local... Um, your local impoundment there. It's a big local water supply dam. It's one mm. that's that's been in the news up and down for it. And and there was a big curtain that was getting put in to, to stop it. But just before we get to that, maybe just explain to people listening um, the devastating effects on our, our um, iconic uh, local um, fish species from what we call thermal pollution, which, which really what we're talking about here is a massive drop mm. in temperature to those fish. Um, yeah, it is, mate. And it, it's not just Burundong, Guesty and Jono. It's, you know, just having a look at the list like Pindari, Copeton, Keep It, right down through Glenbourne, Burundong, as you mentioned, mate, Wyangla, Warren, uh, Warragamba, Burrenjuk, like right down through Yukonbeet and Jindabyne. We, we're polluting our rivers, mate. And it's it's been a problem uh, for, for so many decades that basically what it is, mate, is, you know, come autumn and winter you get what's called stratification in a dam so you'll get a thermal the thermal layer and i know all you blokes who fish know exactly what a thermocline is but it, it has a devastating effect on on the river below the dam so you'll get a, a thermocline form in the dam and it's basically a, a, a thermal blanket within the dam where above it you, you're seeing normal temperatures but below it it can be 17 18 degrees below the surface, the surface temperature of the dam. So once you let that water go, come springtime, and that that water is just building up nicely, it's you know 17, 18 degrees. All those normal spawning mechanisms are starting to play. The fish are moving. They're they're looking to nest, and it's not just cod. It's yellow belly. It could be trout cod. It could be silvers. But if you drop that temperature so artificially, like we have for for decade upon decade it just has a detrimental uh, sort of impact on the fish below. Like we've, we've watched the temperatures here and we're thinking, you know, we're going to have the best cod spawning event. It's going to be so good, lots of natural recruitment, everything's going really, really well. And then we've watched the graph from Water Info New South Wales and it's almost about to hit 20 and then we have to start releasing water from the bottom of the dam and we've seen it go to 12 degrees in the space of 72 hours. So... It's a huge pollution problem. Um, it's archaic. And, and you know, there is technology out there, mate, that means that we can actually fix this, but we haven't quite got there yet. Now, I'm conscious that there's so much to get through today. Matt's just touched on so many points there. And, Gusty, I know you know a little bit about this too. So if we don't mind, lads, I might take a step-by-step step through it so we can so we can unpack what is a pretty complex issue. We'll start with... Guesty, you love analogies, right? We always talk about analogies. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on this one? Jumping into a swimming pool in the middle of summer, 
you put your foot in the top of the, the water to check how cold it is, if you can jump right in. You jump in, and by the time you get to the bottom, it's much colder than what it was. And then you've got to get all your mates and your family to swim the pool around to get it all at an even temperature, right? So I read that the other day in an article that's about to get released um, from Ozfish and Craig kind of Craig Copeland kind of helped me put that one together. So for anyone who's who's wondering what, what what Matt was talking about there, that's that's something that you can think about is the swimming pool analogy. Oh yeah, definitely. Look, it's a, and it, and Matt knows better than anyone. It's a, it's a much bigger slap in the face than that when you're talking like mm. Matt's talking twenty degrees spawning fish and then a sudden eight degree drop. So just outside the window here, Matt, um, uh, I've got. Uh, Tandanus catfish, um, golden perch, and bass in a, just an eight thousand liter pond where I've, I, it's yep. and it fills from my it actually gets run off from my roof and it goes through the pond and then into the stormwater that way. But mm. when we've had big sudden like a big blow and a cold change and I've seen that pond drop it, it's been at around that sort of twenty degrees eighteen twenty degrees and then drop to thirteen or fourteen really really quickly and. And, uh, and we're not talking about spawning fish here, but it will shut their feeding mechanism down for days. Oh, yeah. Just that yep. sudden cold drop. Dropping. And you know yourself, it, 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 you know, it affects animals, affects humans. Um, so, yeah, the effect on those fish when, when they, they're, about to, you know, they're about to spawn or they have spawned is just huge. And, and as you said mm. before, there's mechanisms in place um, where we can, we can do something about it. Now, Burundong was, is it one of the first ones that trialled that big blanket to try and take the water off the surface so what happened with that yeah so three and a half million bucks in uh, water new south wales were the project managers for that one guestie and so basically it was if you could picture a, a big funnel so normally we let the the water go in in most dams from the outlet right at the bottom it's like open the plug and let the water go down the river so this was a, a three and a half million dollar curtain that came up around that that outtake tower and got the water to, to much like a funnel to go down over the top and you were taking that water from the first sort of three to five metres from the surface, which was fantastic in, in theory uh, because you'd be sending the same temperature of, of water that would naturally go down the river and, and you have minimal effect on the temperature below the river. But uh, it got hit by lightning. Um, then the, the rods that were in the bedrock below, they pulled. Um, it was like a, a big plastic membrane and it was just problem after problem. So, you know, three and a half million bucks later and it, it has unfortunately been been deemed a failure. So, you know, recreational fishers, river users, environmentalists are all calling for the next solution. So what we looked at then was what's called um, – multi-level offtake so that's where you've basically got the, the the bell towel that comes up from the outlet and a series of like louver windows that go up and down and you can you can open those windows so that uh you can let go you know natural temperature water depending on what time of the year oh, well, but unfortunately well, that has a huge cost yeah. to do that and i'm talking like you know 50 to 100 million dollars to to put that sort of technology in so just yeah, next level. It's it's almost impossible, but um, yeah, that's that's sort of where we we got to next. But um, look, mate, we're hearing some some huge things on on some new technology, which is called bubble plume technology. And geez, we're excited to hear about that coming along. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm interested to hear that myself. But I guess what what needs to happen, and if there's any new dams, and there's always chat about new dams, and it gets hit on the head, then then the, that type of louver technology in that tower, that needs to be fitted from the word go. And I imagine it's not a huge cost when you do it from the word go when you build a dam, but to try and retrofit these things, it's just it's so hard. I, I guess there's people have thought about big, massive big pumps that could float on the surface and pump the water out and over the wall. There'd be all sorts of situations or solutions mm. that have been put forward. But um, tell us, so this bubble technology you're talking about, how does that work? Well, mate, I think it's it's going to be if, if we can get it in. I think it's going to be even better than multi-level offtake. It's so exciting. So, bubble plume technology is basically like putting a huge fish tank aerator in the bottom of the dam. So, come autumn and winter, you turn this thing on, and, and we're not talking new technology here, guys. We're talking about stuff that's been done overseas, you know, from the eighties and nineties. So, you get a big compressor. And, a, and basically a massive airstone, and it goes right in the bottom of the dam, 
and forms a bubble plume. And what it does is it breaks that thermocline and starts to mix the water and it can have a 30% increase on the te- on the water temperature at the bottom of the dam. And there's so many bounce on, you know, great side effects from it as well because it's actually been proven to help with algal control in the dam. It's also meaning that there's more usable water for our fish in our dams because you've got a more natural sort of temperature occurrence in big impoundments like Copeton and Wyangla and Burundong. So the fish will be able to use more of the water to do their thing, grow and feed in those impoundments, help stop evaporation, and we're letting go warmer water. And the most exciting thing for me, and I suppose, you know, the million-dollar question is, why haven't we got here sooner? Because this technology is off the shelf. We don't have to recreate it. It's already available to purchase and and we can be circulating our empowerments to make them more effective, control the algae, help stop evaporation. And I suppose the most astounding stat for me, guys, is that when when the numbers have been done, it's scientifically shown that 2,000 kilometres of our inland rivers are thermally polluted. So if we can get this right and get this technology in, you can effectively return breeding and stop stunting the growth of our, our native species for 2,000 kilometres of our inland rivers. Oh, no, that's, that's insane. And, and that's a really good point you make about stunting. So it's not only, uh, not only the fact that it, uh, it's upsetting their breeding cycles, could even kill some fish, I guess, at times mm. if the water was really warm and you've got a real cold plume come down. But the fact that, that um, all of those fish, and I know um, a lot of our native fish can handle some crazy low temperatures, right down to one degree up to sort of 30 odd degrees in temperature so they're pretty amazing what they can do but but there's no doubt that they beef up and put more weight on in those warmer waters and and um, that that warmer water when it's more consistent is certainly going to help with the growth rate but it's interesting you talk about that bubble curtain uh, or that uh, is it called a bubble curtain Matt? a a bubble plume bubble plume i should say i'm pretty sure there is one that i did see It'd be worth having a look into it. In the Ross River Dam, um, I was lucky enough to have a look in there at um, at some barra fishing in Townsville, and they had a, a section there where it was all bubbling up and all that sort of thing. And I remember running the sand around there, and I know the fish certainly like to be in that area where those oh, yeah. bubbles were coming up. So I, I, I'm pretty sure they do have one there. That one's a quite a shallow dam, but I know... I was um, Murray Cod fishing in the Guida below Copeton, um, and we've got actually got an episode coming up on Real Action not not too far in the next couple of weeks there, and we were discussing about the fact, you know, and we're fishing Copeton and the Guida at the same time, and looking at the natural depth that a Murray Cod would get to, and even in the Murray River or maybe parts of the Seven or some of the rockier rivers, there might be a, the odd sections that might go 20 metres, 25 metres max, you know, mm. And that's really deep, but most of our rivers and, and out around Dubbo where you are, like 10 metres is a really deep section of the Macquarie. Yeah. That would be fair to say. Big hole. Big oh, hole. absolutely. So so when you've got these dams and uh, some of these dams go to, and certainly Copeton at the moment, 80 metres, 90 metres in depth, as you said, there's it's all great to say we've got this huge chunk of water, but, but I can't imagine a fish like a Murray Cod, for example, that's 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 really designed to be swimming around in waters really no deeper than sort of 15 metres, that it's going to go and sit down in 80 metres. It just doesn't make sense. It's freezing cold. Nah. There's probably not a lot of bait down there. So that that bubble, this, you know, this this bubbling effect that you're talking about, certainly, as you said, it's going to roll that water over, even out the temperature, and then just make more usable space for fish, certainly in our impoundments, let alone improving what goes back out into the river systems. Oh, 100%. Guess you look at the, you know, the actual infrastructure that we're talking about with the compressor and the, the bubble plume technology, you know, we're not talking in, in government speak, you know, huge bucks for this sort of stuff. You know, you might get one for somewhere between three and 500 grand. You could be set up and, and, and have these compressors running and, and mixing that water beautifully and, and making the river work better and also the impoundment work better. Um, but it was, a, I suppose, the biggest was was the power to run them but the way that solar and lithium and and all this technology has come on now um that that's not such a such a problem the only problem is getting this in and and getting some trials going so that we can get the data we can watch a river 
recover, you know, somewhere like Copeton or maybe even Pindari or one of those dams where it's a controlled environment. We can we can watch, you know, what happens in the impoundment. We can watch what happens below it. But, you know, the dozen impoundments that, that thermal pollution has a huge effect within if we can get those rivers to recover, because you know what it's like when it's ice cold, the yabbies are slow, the shrimp are slow, all the tucker in the system is is basically just in hibernation. Yep. So if we can get that natural water going down the system when it should be, like you can go down to the, the Macquarie in December and it is so cold that you wouldn't even swim in it with your kids. And I'm talking December, January. It might be 42 degrees, and the shrinkage factor is just out of control. You just wouldn't go in there and swim, mate. It's uh, absolutely. so cold. Absolutely. <laughs> I was out there oh, a couple of seasons ago. Uh, a young fellow had a cricket carnival there and, and uh, at a mate's place on the Macquarie, and oh, I come back for a swim, and they had let some water down. Oh, i got to tell you, and it was... It's hypothermic. It was... Oh, it was... The kids were playing in 40 degrees, mm. like 38, 39, 40 yeah, degrees. And we're going, we're going to have a swim. I can mm. tell you, the shrinkage was real bad. I can tell you. So, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, and it, it was good. We're actually having a beer late of an afternoon, yeah. and you could actually sit your, sit your sit beer, your beer in, in the water, and it wasn't really yep. get, getting too warm. One other quick thing I was out that way, uh, I've been out that way recently a few times, but. Talking about the power, how's the solar farm there at Wellington? Surely, yeah. there's a, surely we can pinch a couple. Of, I'll, I'll chip in. I've got a couple of rolls of wire here, mate. We'll run some wire out, to, <laughs> out the Burrendong, and we'll hook a we'll hook a compressor up. It'll be easy. Hey, I reckon. Oh, I reckon absolutely. one of the most common questions that a listener might be asking to this lads is, why on earth are we are we releasing water from a dam and down into a river? And it's it's somewhat of a basic question, but. It's got, from my understanding, Matt, and you might know more than me, is it to do with basically irrigation at the bottom of the dam and, and farmers needing water in periods of drought in summer? Or when it's it, a bit it is, mate. It, it's multifaceted, but it, look, it, we're in a in an agricultural environment. Like I know a, a lot of guesties mates out here understand, but you've, you've got um, – a lot of irrigated crop production, but you've also got town water supply. So there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of people out here who rely on the river and Dubbo draws approximately, you know, 60% of its consumable water from the river. We also have bores, um, but then you've also got, you know, a really, really key, um, not, you know, sort of user of that water, which is environment, because we've got the Macquarie Marshes, only a couple of hundred k's downstream here, which are, one of the most amazing things you'll ever see, the bird life and, you know, that marsh system is is just, it's a Ramsar-listed wet site. Like, it's incredible. But, um, you know, the river really is the lifeblood of, of this, this region, but you also have agricultural uh, with extraction. Um, you've got, you know, people who need to extract their drinking water and town supply um, and also the environment who, who needs to have that good flow for things like fish connectivity, um, you know, nesting water birds, all those sorts of things. So water management out here, mate, look, it, it is a really tricky space. Um, and it wasn't so long ago that we were pulling fish out of the mud out here to try and rescue uh, just an insurance population back in 2018, mate. Like, it was terrible. We had our backs to the wall. There was a cease to flow in the Macquarie. Um, we had a massive team from fisheries out here about 50 Ausfish volunteers and all the farmers, we all got together and we got about 40 or 50 breeding pairs of, of Goldens out and sent them off to um, the, the fish centre at Narandra. We got cod to about 106, 110 centimetres out, um, about 40 of them, and they went to Narandra as well. And, and since 2018, we've seen a couple of hundred thousand of their progeny come back, which we've restocked the river with, and we've just gone into this amazing boom breeding event. But... You know, sadly, restocking um, isn't the answer. It's, it's you know, something you do when you really have to. There's no fish in an area. But if we have a healthy river where the temperatures are normal, you've got the habitat in place and you've got the tucker in place, so a lot of the re-snagging work that we've done, a lot of that riparian re-veg work we've done with the river repair bus, some restocking that we, you know, we, we have done in the early days to try and get those native fish numbers up, that has been critical. But, you know, the answer to this whole equation is if you've got a healthy river and the temperature is natural, those fish will spawn and lay more eggs than, than the river knows what to do with. Mother Nature just takes it in a stride and will do it. But if we're going to continually pollute not only our river, but so many rivers across the Murray-Darling Basin, 
with this unnatural cold water pollution, then she just doesn't have a chance to do it. But if we can get it right, mate, I've got massive hopes. And bubble plume technology, um, yeah, look, we've, we've got our, our hat hung on this one, mate. We just really hope it can happen in the next couple of years. Yeah, look, I, I'm all for it too. And a lot of our listeners are coastal-based and they're probably listening, oh, look, you know, it's this really, you know, something that affects me? Absolutely. And if you haven't, I've got more, I've got a Quinny, Quintrex car top around the corner there. Oh, there's nothing better for me. Like it's one of my favourite things to do. Straight out on the roof, it's got a little. Actually, I've got a nine point nine mercury for it now, Matt. It goes like an absolute rocket ship when I can. When yeah. the river's safe, now I've got enough water in the rivers, I can open it up. But absolutely, there's, there, there's nothing better than to do that and and to go for a drive west, find a local tackle store, go and go and find a BCF at Dubbo or or uh, or at Tamworth or wherever you're going. I talk to somebody, oh, how's the river? river's never been better. They'll probably tell you at the moment as far as water goes because we've had so much yep. rain. You know, what do I need? A spinner bait, a surface law, you know, do a bit of camping, do a bit of exploration and go and, cha- go and target um, some of our native species. And you've got to remember fish like, um, uh, certainly like Murray Cod, for example, they're, they're nowhere else in the world. They're our, they're our native iconic fish and to, to catch one and gently hold it, get a photo of it, check the, the patterns out on them and watch it swim off is just a pretty cool thing. And if if you're – and I have heard a bit of a dirty thing about you, Hanson, that you're heading this way and fishing our waters these days, mate. You've turned into a saltwater fisherman, but we're talking the reverse. We're talking the anti-Hanson fisherman here. Hey, that's are, for both things. <laughs> all right. Yeah, well, I, I, so I'm talking about going back the other way. I, I just urge you – to go and do that, and and um, and and what we're talking about with this thermal pollution is and trying to fix it. And Matt, Matt needs a mate. The things you guys did in the drought, you guys need need some serious recognition for what you did in the drought, what you're trying to do now. Um, and I'm all for it. And if we can improve it so that the next time I go fishing, my fishing's better, and that's what it is too. It's it's not you know it's for the kids of the future and everybody else. And I know it, that gets said a lot. But um, but the opportunity's there and the technology's there. And like you said, if it's 500 grand or a million dollars or $3 million, I know that sounds like a lot of money, but but in the scheme of things, it's really not to, to try and fix no, that. So. Not at all, mate. You know, like when the, the numbers are what gets my blood pumping, mate. Like if, if you could return the breeding to 2,000 kilometres of our inland rivers and – and get the shrimp and the weed beds and all that life pumping again. Like it, it's basically like here's a whole brand new river, New South Wales. Like it, it, it is so exciting to think that this is what we are now proposing. You know, we had the curtain, yeah, it was a, a failure, but it was a first attempt in learning. Um, and, and now it's just, you know, the technology is here and I think that the right people are behind us. Um, and, yeah, I think watch this space, guys. It's a very exciting time. We've just got to see what the next two or three years bring. But um, 2,000 Ks is a lot of river, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And we need a bit of luck. Like, how bloody unlucky is it that it got hit by lightning, for Christ's sake? Like, oh, what's oh, it, mate. Seriously. What's the stats oh, on lightning? Like, isn't it oh, like one mate, in... One in oh. You're more likely to get eaten by a shark than, than get hit by lightning or something ridiculous? Oh, yep, mate. just popped it, mate. And it was, um, you know, a, a great attempt. But the, the thing is... We recognise the problem. We, we, we recognise the problem, and that is that we're pumping cold water down our rivers. Yeah. So, mm. you know, the, the first step in any process is to realise there's a problem. We have a huge pollution problem. It's cold water. Um, but, yeah, look, I, I think we're on a bit of a journey here now, and I think the right people are behind it. So, uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited about yeah, it. Well, before you. we um... – I want to – hang on. Yeah. I'm going to ask him a question first. So what, what – so – You've put the bait caster down, and the spinner baits are all getting dusty at home. So, what have you been up to, mate? What, so, what's where you've been headed? So, for somebody who lives west of the Great Divide, and you'd be a great example. What What do you like to do if you're heading over our part of the world? Oh, mate, I I bought my first outside boat probably four years ago, and um, that was pretty wild. Doing your first bar crossing and learning tides and moon and run like this is only stuff of what you guys do on tv but anyway i bought a, I bought a little six meter center console boat and and then yeah started talking to a few mates in the know at jervis bay and got myself a down rigger and started down rigging for kings and many many a failed trip but then we started catching a few kings and just got home two weeks ago we went up to ballon or up near uh, craig copeland from Ozfish's oh, yep. place there and 
Oh, mate, the red fishing. I, I took a few few bush chooks, a few mates of mine up there who had never caught a snapper. <laughs> and um, two of them got their first ever snapper just on four kilos. Absolute minds blown. So, yeah, we've just been learning as we go, mate. Like, honestly, it's like going to Mars. When you're from the country and you've never really saltwater fished, it, it is like going to Mars. But, you know, we've put the time in and... Um, got on the water and, you know, we've caught some beautiful kings and snapper and cobes now and uh, went up and tried our, our first couple of mackerel seasons and, mate, just, just mind's blown. Totally saltwater addicted now, I have to admit it, mate. And, that, and you know what? <laughs> they taste, saltwater fish taste so much better than freshwater fish, oh, period. Yeah. So that's what people go, like, I could never, ever, ever in a million years kill a Murray cod, like, for example, uh, I'll let for him me, go too. Ab- absolutely, hundred percent catch and release for me. And if you want to eat a eat a fish, you know, knock a, the right size flathead over or, or a pan size snapper, a much better or eating. A red but, fin perch or something. But like that. on the other hand, I got to tell you, if I if the world's going to end tomorrow, what am I doing? I reckon I'm casting a surface lure for a bass or a Murray cod. You know, that's mm. in some little hidden creek or junction where no one's around. It's just such an addictive oh. thing. And to you've do, said so. that before. Hey, Matt, yeah. I wouldn't mind asking for someone who's made the transition. Um, mm. Did you have to go through the whole process of looking at things like uh, seagrass beds, um, looking at you know where you sit on the wreck, all all the things that we do on a day to day basis, or maybe the same that what we would do if we went west? Was that learning experience? Like you started fishing again? Surely that oh, was a part mate. of the appeal. Oh, it, it was like I like I grew up on like I'm an Oberon boy, you know that's where my oh, grandparents nice. were. So. I grew up on the like I'd just get them to drop me off at the dam when I was 10, 14 years old and and go trout fishing and then you know fish uh, wet flies blind for you know two pound rainbow trout and granted I'd just be so proud you get home and you got you know a couple of really nice rainbow trout there and then out here in the river you know casting spinnerbaits for cod or rolling plastics up trees for for golden perch and you know I've got two little boys and they've all been doing that and then for me it was like okay, now I've, I've got my first outside boat. It sort of took me back to that same energy of like a six, eight-year-old kid going and catching your first inland fish. To me, it was like, you know, I'm in my mid-30s and I've, I've never had the opportunity or, or the oh, boat mid- to be able to go and fish the coast. Mid-30s, oh, my ass. Oh, just lit. Oh, yeah, sorry. As soon as we go on air, he's just 10 years. <laughs> Yeah, I look 60, but I'm just mid-30s. Oh, right, wow, Come nice on. sensation. I didn't realise you were 16 last time I caught up with you. That's all. <laughs> but no, I just, mate, it was, yeah, it was honestly like learning fishing all over again. And, um, it, you know, to, to, for, for a bush chook to go and learn how important a tide change is or moon phase was a big one for me as well, yep. picking that right moon phase and just we have to drive nine hours or seven hours to get to a lot of those sort of north coast spots and you do really play Russian roulette with that weather window. You might get there and sit there for four days if it's nasty and you can't get through the bar but um, to see some of my mates who have never caught saltwater fish go there and catch a decent snapper or yeah, even a seven or an eight kilo mackerel. Like it, it is, mate. We've just fallen in love with the ocean in the last couple of years. It's been really good, good eh? Good on you, mate. That's and awesome. You don't get hammered by the flies. You don't have to kick black and brown snakes out of the mm. way while you're wandering around. So it does have a few other a advantages. Few perks to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and like the water it. seems to be a natural temperature too. It's yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, there's no <laughs> cold water going in there. How, how is it? Yeah. How, yeah, no, there's only right. warm water when yeah. Matt's going for a leak off the back. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, is it, how is it that you've got a really wash your trailer properly in your boat mm. down after being in the salt mate that's the big that'd be one that oh you. mate there is a lot more work in it but um i've gotten in a bit of a rhythm mate we we hit it with the good old salt wash but as soon as i pull back into dubbo the routine is back a straight in on the macquarie turn the bilge yeah. on the uh the bait flush <laughs> just it. run the motor everything and, and that seems to have done the old trailer pretty good just backing her into the fresh after a trip up there so yeah, good on you mate hey guess he touched on it before but a bit mm. of a shout out to the work that matt does too for the uh inland waterways chapter at Ozfish. He's been leading that since day one. He actually went over to the States, I think, with Craig all those years ago. Um, and he's been a, a real champion for the for what the work that they're doing out there. So good on you, mate. We need more people like you flying the flag, flying the future of fishing flag, I reckon you oh, could call it. 100%. All right. Well, I'll have to keep an eye out for you in this six-metre centre console. Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, for, for sure, seeing you're invading this part of the world. Next time, mate, I'll, I'll, I'll make a point of coming and saying hello. I'm actually out at Dubbo in a few weeks' time, so I might try and look you up for a quick beer if you've got time anyway. So. Mate, that sounds fantastic, mate. It'd be great to catch up with you guys. Maybe go 
for a leak in the local river and boost that temperature back up if you can. Yeah, I don't think that's really going to cut, that, mate. It's pretty cold. Thanks yeah. for your time today, Matt. We'll catch up. Thanks, Matty. Good See on you, guys. Mate. Bye, mate. Thank you. Bye. What he's a legend. Oh, no, he's a great, he's a great guy. Good bloke. And, and a good communicator. And I think that's so crucial um, when you've got... Uh, issues at that level where it needs, you know, it's not, it's not a, it's not a, uh, a raffle down the pub that's going to fix this. No. It's, it's, um, it's really good communication um, at the highest level, uh, at a government level, mm. and certainly the way our government's situated at the moment, where, where you know, um, teal independents and greens seem to have a lot of say. Um, you know, hopefully then it's something that we can try and get over the board at, at the moment too. Yeah, yeah, it's a topical conversation, one that I encourage you to go do your own research on too. If you haven't, there's tons of articles and documentaries and that on YouTube. Guesty, let's take a quick break. It's a very content-heavy segment. We'll get into some fishing shortly. Before I do so, permission to say one more joke? Oh, God. Right, they were pretty good the other week, the well, jokes. Right I want to hear one from you, but you come mm. unprepared as usual. Uh, yeah, I've got one, but it's not fit for yeah, human we'll consumption. Just to, just to we'll go to a break, um, you know, Mozart. Mm. What what did he do in his grave? What did he do in his grave? Yeah. Um, well, not a lot. He'd be just sleeping, I'd imagine, like everyone else. Decompose. Oh. We're, we're out of here. We'll be back shortly. <laughs> <laughs> 